Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about um, oceans, the blue planet, so our, our, basically our planetary lifeline, um, conservation, as well as um, us, or you, and the future, and our roles in it. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a marine mammal uh, ecologist, and I co-founded uh, a local marine conservation NGO uh, named Marset. And so we do research on dolphins and porpoises mm -hmm. and dugongs here in Malaysia, and we use that science to inform conservation work. Uh, and I've been doing this, um, this sort of job or this sort of work for the last 13 years of my life. Um, and uh, so the question that I want to pose today is, um, do we have an ocean conservation uh, problem? And through the, through the work that I've been doing um, for the last 13 years of my life, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of problems uh, in the ocean. I've seen a lot of animals get caught in fishing nets. I've seen how um, their health is compromised. Um, you know, we've seen animals with skin problems. We've seen animals. We've seen animals with um, uh, very skinny. We've cut open animals that have consumed a whole lot of uh, plastics. So, you know, do we have an ocean conservation problem? I think the answer is yes. No, I think the slides are not moving, um, so I'll just keep going. And so, do we have a problem? And a lot of people think that maybe we don't, because especially for us here who live in the city, you know, we are quite disconnected from uh, the ocean. It's far from us. We don't see it. Um, you know, we don't live near it. So maybe everything is fine. And, and a lot of people think that fish basically comes from the supermarket. So as long as you go to the supermarket and there's always going to be fish, then there's always you know, going to be um, fish. And you're, you're never going to run out of food. Um, however, however, in Malaysia, we've actually, we've actually lost... Um, 90, almost 90 percent of a lot of our fishery stocks and um, basically our sea is almost empty. We are one of the largest consumers of seafood in Southeast Asia and we are, we are one of the largest consumers of seafood in Southeast Asia and um, we've depleted almost 90 percent of our fishery stock and the, and the picture that you see behind me um, is basically all the fish that didn't make the cut as commercially valuable fish. Uh, so they end up being scooped up in a basket like this to be grounded into fish meal, to be fed into aquaculture, uh, and to be made into your fish ball, fish cake, and any fish-related products. So what's bad about it is that because we've already depleted you know, almost all our fishery stock, and at the same time, um, at, we've already depleted our fishery stock, and at the same time, all, the, all those little fishes uh, are not being left in the sea. They're, they're, they're being taken out and um, being taken to be made into all those products I just mentioned about. The next problem that we have is the, the issue of marine debris that's impacting uh, you know, all our world's oceans. And guess what? Uh, in 2015, a group of scientists published a paper and basically they had looked at the amount of rubbish that is going from land into the sea and they looked at it at every country across the world and guess what? Malaysia made it to the top 10 on this ladder of shame. And considering that we're not a very large country, we still managed to make it to you know, rank number eight. And that's, um, that's quite telling. That's an issue that I think we really need to think about, we need to address. So as you can see on the chart, um, we're on number eight. And you know, if, if you think that, oh, but how can this be true, then you know, the next photograph I took in Samporna, which is the gateway to our top diving destination, which is Pulau Sipadan. Okay, just, just take a look at this photograph. Basically, it's like a supermarket. I think if you were to wade in there, you'll find anything from diapers, to straws, to cups, to plates, to shoes, to slippers, baskets, and maybe even the kitchen sink. And this is just one of many examples of places all around the country, a oh, beautiful country, that, um, we are, where we are suffering from the issue of um, marine debris. And it's not just sitting there, it's actually getting into our oceans, into our waterways. Ne next. 
And every year now, at least 8 million tons of plastics are going into the sea. And, you know, these plastics have nowhere to go. They're just sitting there. And, and scientists have um, predicted that by the year 2050, there are going to be more plastics in our oceans than fish. So, you know, and as I said earlier, we are a large fish-eating nation. And then we rank eight on that ladder of shame. But in 30 years' time, there could be more plastics in the ocean. And actually, it's already happening now because some scientists are finding that even the plankton are consuming plastic. And then the fish is con you know, um, consuming the plankton. And then we are consuming the fish. Because these plastics don't go away. They just simply break down into these mi minute things called microplastics. So we really need to think about this issue, marine debris. It's huge. So the ocean is a continuous system. Just like this beautiful infinity scarf that I'm wearing, um, the ocean is, is infinite. You know, it's, it's connected as much as we think that it might be vast. And as much as you think that, okay, if I were to just toss something in here, I'm too lazy to walk to the bin, I'm just gonna toss it right here. And it just floats away and you'll never see it again. This away actually ends up being on somebody else's shore or it ends up being on, you know, in some animal's stomach or it ends up being fished out by somebody else somewhere far away. And, and just like this scarf, you know, our impact, our, our actions here will impact something over on the other side. Thank you. And so... So what I was trying to illustrate is that it's a continuous system. So like this scarf, if I were to pull here, that this moves. If I were to pull here, this moves. So we mustn't ever think that our actions um, are all in isolation because it, it, it basically impacts everything um, out there. No matter how small your action might be, just always remember that the ocean is a continuous system and that you should never take your little action for granted and that we should always be more responsible about how we treat the ocean and how we're disposing of our little um, waste. So given that all, you know, these are just some of the issues that are impacting us as a society, as a country, as a, as a, as a species, and moving forward into the future, how are we going to redefine conservation? I often get a lot of emails from young people like yourself saying, Dear Dr. Louisa, I love dolphins and I want to save them. Dear Dr. Louisa, I want to be a marine conservationist. Dear Dr. Louisa, I want to be working in conservation. And that's really good. I, I like that you know, there are people out there who are interested in taking up this cause. But I think that we also have to remember to move away from these traditional ways of doing conservation into thinking that um, you know, what you see on TV is all there is, or that you, only, you, know, you have to be a marine biologist to do marine conservation work. The truth is, moving forward into conservation, we have to be a lot more practical. And um, here are some ways that we can consider if any of you out there are interested in doing you know, marine science and conservation work, um, here are some things to consider. First of all, you can do research, that's great. We all need research and we need science. Science helps us find out um, problems and science helps us find solutions. But um, all too often, um, a lot of scientists live in an ivory tower, as you can see over there. and. Uh, they think that, okay, I'm doing science and it's so awesome and I've just discovered this thing, woohoo. Um, when in fact, uh, there is a huge gap between the scientists in the ivory tower, or any scientists at all, and the community out there. You know, so somewhere further along, along, down the way, there is maybe a villager that somebody else is talking to and say, hey ma'am, I don't think you should be doing this destructive, destructive fishing method. It's killing a lot of endangered species and it's causing overfishing. And she goes, endangered species? Overfishing? What's that? So the point is that we can do science for conservation, but we have to ensure that our work is taken out there and it's brought down to the ground and applied on the ground um, in order to solve you know, conservation problems. So the, the point I'm trying to get at here is that you can be a researcher if you want to work in conservation, but also be an educator. Be an educator. Take your work 
and tell others about it, share your knowledge and have them share their knowledge within their circles and so on and so forth. Next, I, I've come to realize in the you know, last 14 years of, or 13 years of doing this that to be able to care about the environment, especially if you're in a rural, poor community, is that socioeconomics are important. People who are poor cannot care about conservation. You can't say, stop doing that, stop fishing that now because it's killing all the endangered species. Well, their first worry is, how am I going to put food on the table for my family? I can't care about conservation. What's dolphins got, you know, how does that impact my life? So we have to always remember that in doing conservation now and in, in wanting to have people care about it, you know, in the large, um, the large majority of people, we need to consider their socioeconomic standing, which means that you can come in to do conservation work by providing communities with solutions, with alternative livelihoods, and train them up to be stewards of their own environment and empower them to, to have a livelihood, but to also be able to care for the environment. And then there's um, this. So we live in an age of biotechnology. And so we live in an age of biotechnology and information is at our fingertips. And we live in an age where things are being engineered and developed um, you know, to solve many problems or just for fun. And these things called compostable packaging are available, but they're not widely available. And I found this online and it says, packaging the future. My question is, why wait till the future? As I demonstrated earlier, we have a severe problem with marine pollution. There's only so much more the planet can take in terms of single-use plastics and things that never break down um, and, and truly be reabsorbed into the earth. So I urge people out there, if you're interested in doing your part for the planet, consider perhaps uh, engaging in some form of biotechnological innovation to make compostable packaging, for example, uh, more affordable and more widely available. Because they are available now, but they cost a lot more than your paper cup or your styrofoam plate or your plastic cups. So people will opt to just go for those disposable, one-time use things. So, but we can't afford to wait for the future because it has to start now, otherwise we'd be living in our, you know, our own pile of rubbish. And um, the, next the next thing is, some people will say, okay, well, I'm already doing my part, I recycle. And that's really good. And I think all of you out here, any of you out here who are already sorting your waste or um, recycling, doing recycling, that's really good. But recycling really cannot be the only long-term solution for our planet because essentially we are still, to recycle, um, you are still producing things, you know, to be put onto this planet. The important thing to remember is that to want to effect conservation as well, it's not just about recycling, it's about reducing, okay? So we need to reduce. Can we give up that plastic straw? Can we give up that plastic plate? Can we bring our own... Um, Tapao uh, container to pack, you know, to get food if you're eating, if you're not going to cook at home and you want to you know, take away, can you bring your own packaging um, that's reusable? So we need to remember that it is important moving forward into the future um, to reduce. You know, what are the things we can give up that we don't really need? That's, you know, just never, if we have it, it, it doesn't make a difference to our lives and, and also it, it never goes away. And remember, as I said, there's really no such thing as a way. So think about that. We need to also reduce. So this is something that I want to touch on a little bit. It's called being silly for the environment. So I'm just going to explain in a minute I've, after I put on my little hat. OK, so I look silly now because I'm wearing a little dugong hat. Um, but there's a point I'm trying to make. Um, so it's okay to be silly for the environment. You know, I've been called all sorts of things, ocean hugger, tree hugger, you know, eco warrior, whatever. And some people don't even mean it in the, in the good, good sense of the word. But the point is, this is not about tree hugging. This is not about ocean hugging. This is not about hugging anything. It's, it's about your future. It's about, you know, the living environment that you are going to live in. Um, and so it's okay to want to fight for a, a brighter future. It's okay to want to fight to live in a clean environment. 
in the future, and it's okay to be silly. So, for example, um, one of the things that I do nowadays is when I when I I eat out and I order a drink, I'll tell the waiter or waitress, "No straw, please." And a lot of times, I get you know this look. What? You don't want straw? How are you gonna drink? Well, you know, I can. I have a mouth. I can drink from the cup. And but at first, it it discouraged me when I was tr starting out to you know just refuse straws. I thought, oh, they they can think I'm weird. But then as time went on, I just thought, who cares? You know, I I want to do my part for the environment, and I don't care if I'm being silly or if they think I'm silly. You know, for example, it's okay to question where your seafood came from. It's okay to ask. Did this fish, you know, by the, the, pro the method of catching it, did it cause the death of many other marine species? Was it caught ethically? Were the people who caught it, you know, um, were they paid properly? It's okay to ask. You know, I've been shot down. Ah, just eat your fish, lah. Stop asking so many questions. But I ask them anyway because I think it's important to know, you know, where that, that in, in the face of dwindling fishery stocks, it's very important to ask these questions. Or even, you know, even if the barista at you know, um, the coffee cafe looks at you funny because they have to make your coffee in a cup that you brought and not in the paper cup that um, you know, they usually serve coffee in, does it matter? Does it matter that for that you know, few minutes while you're waiting there for your coffee, the barista thinks, oh, this person's a bit extreme or weird? No, it doesn't matter. So the point is just, it's okay. Be silly for the, for the environment because it's about your future. It's about um, taking charge and ensuring that um, you can live in a planet that's going to be alive in the next 30, 40, 50 years. So, you know, being, um, being environmentally responsible is inconvenient. I won't doubt that. But would you rather live like this? Um, you know, surrounded by your rubbish, maybe waking up, you know, rolling out of bed and there's just tons of, you know, stuff that you didn't, you know, that didn't have anywhere to go anymore. So we have to think about this in the future. How much more, you know, can our planet take? So I want to challenge you, you know, get out there. Our country is beautiful, but there's a lot of environmental problems. So don't just read about it on Facebook or through the newspapers or from your neighbor, you know, like listening to a story from your neighbor. I challenge you to get out there to get out there to see for yourself what are these issues. Take yourself to a fish landing site. See how they land the fish. See um, you know, what the conditions are. See what's being landed. Are there still much fish that's being landed? Or take, you know, go visit a landfill. See for yourself the amount of rubbish that we as a society are generating and that this rubbish really has nowhere to go. It's mountains high. Looking at a picture is one thing, I think experiencing it firsthand is another. And I think it's through these um, you know, hands-on experiences that you can really decide for yourself, okay, what's a stand I'm going to make for the future of the environment that I'm going to be living in? So I'd like to suggest, um, just sort of close off soon by saying that um, these are two very good documentaries that I would recommend all of you to watch. One is The, the End of the Line which talks about the state of the um, you know, fisheries all around the world. And the other one is called A Plastic Ocean. And a lot of, a lot of the things that I've covered, actually, you know, these documentaries cover as well. But it, you know, visually, they've captured some of these biggest issues that are plaguing our blue planet um, quite aptly. So I would suggest that you, you know, take some time out to um, watch these two documentaries. And so lastly, I, I leave you with this. This is a real, real photograph which I took um, somewhere on, on one of our beaches and it's, it's a plea, it's a plea for help. It's a plea for help for our blue planet, it's a plea for help for our oceans. The ocean that feeds us, the ocean that provides a lot of people with jobs, almost three billion people in this world rely on it for jobs. And you know, it's the oceans that have brought you everything that you have right now your clothes, your phones, your laptop, your shoes. How did it get to you? Most of these things were shipped to the country. Um, you know, so the ship needed an ocean to sail to bring you your things. So um, do not discount the importance of the blue planet and think about what you can really do to secure your future um, by taking care of you know, our planetary lifeline. Thank you.